When friends and lovers forsake you, all you got to do is to be bold. I knew it years ago that those who undermined me had their minds undermined, but I never mind. They should keep on undermining because I'm a real good. I must undergo mining. Talking of mining, it leads to discovery. We mine to discover. We learn to discover. We observe to discover. Friends can uncover you at the same time discover you. But I don't want to discover you. I would rather discover more. So I go on the internet and I listen to words of wisdom and intellect. Availability of information, interviews of great men and women all over the diaspora and all nations, creativity at its best, dexterity of research, no need to go through any formal education. I introduce you to the Discovery Show. Let your friends and your family know the struggles before the blow, their highs and their lows. Pay attention to this show, it will make you feel at ease. The Discovery Show on YouTube got the steez. Now Perry, the presenter, please pose for the camera. I want to hear you say cheese. We are airborne like a flu. I want to hear you sneeze. It's true. The Discovery Show is live on air. Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. See ya. TDS TV. Yearn to learn. Host, Perry Precious. Executive producer, James. Hi, thank you so much for joining us here on the Discovery Show. Here we say yen to learn. This is a show that interview professionals in the diaspora and beyond who are making significant impacts in the area of healthcare, politics, education, and what have you. And today I'm very, very, very excited to be interviewing one gentleman I've known for a while. So let me tell you something little about this gentleman. I met him over a decade ago when I was in the university. He was in a different university, but we met through student leadership platforms and he's been inspiring from then up till now and he's been a great man today we're going to talk about pushing the boundaries of nursing and health professions education the inspiring story of a young associate professor i'll come very shortly to introduce my guest to you just stick and stay with us here on the discovery show but in the meantime please send in your questions send in your comments subscribe to our channels on facebook instagram twitter and here on youtube my name is precious and i did you do ably produced by james Cobner upon <laughs> So my guest is <laughs> Professor Krisma de la Christmas. He's actually a Ghanaian trained nurse and currently he's an associate professor um, in South Africa. I'll leave the details to him to introduce himself. The Eagle, you are welcome to the Discovery Show. <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I'm glad to uh, be here and also to have these discussions with you. It's we really are grateful important. that you were able to make it after a long time you managed to come <laughs> eh? we are so grateful thank you so much great so i mean i know you a bit but for those who don't know you and even those who may know you a bit like just like myself can you tell us a bit about yourself who is christmas de la christmas i mean walk us through your life right from childhood all the way to about secondary school let's see who really you are and what has the, the journey been for you so far? The challenges, the learning points, um, the opportunities that came your way all the way to secondary school. Tell us a bit about that. Thank you very much, uh, Precious. It's been a very long journey, if I should say. I had my primary school in many um, institutions because um, I didn't have a stable um, family background growing up. Mm -hmm. So I started with... Um, through a good basic school, it's in the Volta region. Uh, I didn't spend up to two grades there, and then I moved to um, Keta. Now at Keta, I started with Keta Basics. Um, uh, we, we call it um, Keta State, so it's like Anglo State Basic School. Mm -hmm. I got up to grade 
um, 7, which is GSS 1, then I had to leave because of family challenges, and then I stopped school for a year. Then someone looked at me and said, no, you have some skills that I need, but then I also want you to continue your education. So why don't you come to Angloga? So I went to Angloga, Donogwa, where I finished my basic education. So was young, uh, I do quite a lot of things. So I was into grinding cornmeal. If you eat banku and things is that, even from class four, I used to operate cornmeals. Uh, and then I do some form of fishing because we are fishermen by um, trade and culture. So if all those on the Keta Lagoon and also the Gulf of Guinea, we are surrounded by the lagoon to the um, west and then the sea to the east. And so we fish more of the times. And also we do um, this petty farming because Keta or Anglogan shallot farming. It's one of the big things there that we do. So I was involved into a lot of skills, but more was into the grinding of cornmeal. So I can tell you that I grinded cornmeal to finish basic school. That is uh, oh, how so after school I go to the mills and then, yeah, that kind of thing. Then, after finishing Angola Donogo Basic School, I needed to progress to secondary school. So, I chose Angola Secondary School because it was close to where I finished my basic school. Mm -hmm. Then, an uncle of mine who I stayed with earlier in life um, said that no, you cannot go to um, that secondary school, whilst I am here as the head of science department. I chose science. Um, if you know, we have different pathways when you are going to high school. Yeah. So he said, no, you have to then wait for a year before you can come to uh, Keta Secondary School where he was the head of science department and also he led the chemistry department then. Mm -hmm. So I had to have another break in education for a year. Then the next year I got into Keta Secondary School, which we always say Jolali, and uh, we respond now or never. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the interruptions in uh, my early life education. Mm -hmm. But um, it's all for good because there are people that I met at various stages um, that were very helpful to me. I wouldn't have met if I'd gone uh, or if I'd had those smooth form of um, education. Mm -hmm. So basically, that has been the early life and also education. It was difficult because my dad is a fisherman who has a fishing company in Ivory Coast. Okay. So, and he prefers that I go to school in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So what it means is that I have to stay with one relative and the other at various stages in life because he wasn't, the whole family was then in Ivory Coast. And yeah. uh, I had to go to school down here. So as early as I think six years, I was in Ghana. So I haven't spent a lot of time with my biological parents growing up. Wow. Yeah. No, this is, it's, uh, wow. I mean, of course, when I put out the advert, I did say a young associate professor. But I mean, for people who are far away, they might think it's been a very smooth journey. From what you've said, at least you had about two years of interruption right from your basic education. And look at the challenges you've been talking about. And one thing that really fascinates me is that you said someone said you have a skill that I need. At that early age, somebody was able to identify that, look, there's something in you and I need you. And that is very fascinating and uh, very encouraging as well. Wow, that's that's really good to know and how the journey has been. So if you have to tell people who are going through similar challenges now, I mean, especially pre-tertiary experiences, what would be the summary of what you've said to them? What, what would you say to encourage them? So I, I can tell them that everyone has a specific journey mm -hmm. and there are some forms of resistances that you need to overcome if you want to become who you want to be. So every form of struggles that they may be going through now mm. is a means to an end. Mm. 
So they shouldn't see it as a form of retrogression, but it's a test. I could make it uh, say it's a test. Because, for example, this person that I said have found me thinking I am gifted yeah. is an electrician, a trained electrician. And my uncle I was staying with them in Keta had a corn meal. So I used to grind from grade four. Then there are times that we have electrical problems at the corn meal. And he is supposed to come fix it. He would try everything the whole day. He will not fix it. Then one time I'll wake up at dawn and then I will be led by the spirit to enter the corn meal. <laughs> Early in the morning, I am grinding the corn meal. And then he will be like, what happened? I said, I fixed the electrical problems. Now, I haven't been trained. Like, this is someone in grade five. Mm. You, do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then I've been doing it. So when he set up a corn meal in another place, and at that time I was having those challenges, he said, no, really? come and support me with this corn meal. And then I also support you mm. um, to go to school. You get it? So some of the challenge, if I hadn't had that experience of grinding corn meal, at that young age, people might call it maybe exploitation and stuff like that. But yeah. that was what led me to the next um, stage of life. And so, yeah, there are some of the struggles that we go through now that we think they are struggles, but they're actually preparing us for what lies ahead um, and in our journey. This is breathtaking. Serious, we've just done a few minutes of this interview, but I'm already encouraged. Like I said, I've known you over a decade, um, a bit closer, but mostly from afar. And I thought perhaps things have been relatively smooth for you, but this really tells me that the persistence is there and I, 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 I definitely want to encourage everyone. And now look at where you are. So, I mean, keep going, um, Chris Mal. That is really, really encouraging. So I met you at the university level. Of course, from what you've said, it means they are financial issues were complicit and all that you had challenges and all that how did you get into the university and in there what were your experiences what were the challenges you faced at the university level what were the opportunities that you you embraced and generally what were your experiences in the university as well and what led you to making a decision um to pursue nursing very well i i i can tell you that it's quite a lot of complex uh, scenarios that played out uh, at a time when decisions were being made. Yeah. So when I finished high school, I was still then in Keta, grinding cornmeal. Mm -hmm. Then an uncle who lives in Tema came back and said, what are you doing here? I said, no, I operate this and I'm waiting for this. Like, no, you cannot be preparing for university and live with this form of life. And so... I want you to leave and join me in Tema. He runs a lot of programs for basic schools. Um, right. If you read um, in basic school, you will find a book called Science in Scope. Okay. It was one of the major books we use for our uh, general science in basic school. They are the writers and distributors. So he pulled me into yeah. um, his line of business. Then we go setting past questions for basic schools and distributing marking. Then he found me a, a school that the science teacher left. That was Laboni SDA. If you know Laboni, it's very close yeah. to um, Laboni Secondary. Yeah. So I took up a short term a contract there for a year because to just keep in for yeah. their student was raising money for the university. Okay. Then I finished there and I got employed in another um, school, also close, it's called Vision Seed Academy. It's also in La Macbeth. Now they have um, another campus right behind Zenith College. So I taught there to raise fees for university. So yes, that is how I managed to pay my admission fees. So anytime at the month ends, I raise the money, I will give it to an auntie to keep for me in Ashaiman. Sometimes I do weekends in Ashaiman or Tema, thereabouts. And then over the six months, I managed to raise enough. I think we paid around 520 cities in 2006 going to the university. Yeah. So yes, I raised money to pay um, the admission fees. 
I only applied to UCC and I only applied to nursing because I, at a point, I had very good grades from high school. I was one of the bright students in my class, part of the science and math quiz club. Uh, club. You know, Kepa Secondary yeah. School, we are one of those schools that do well in the science, at least to some extent. So yeah. I was trained for science and math quiz. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody will say we want to read medicine, engineering. So how did I make the choice? Yeah. Looking at my financial background, I am looking for something that I can cope with in terms of raising funds whilst I was still in school. Then okay. when I complete, I wouldn't want to buy either. So I want to find something doing. But whilst I was doing this people teaching, I can call it, I was then awarded as one of the best teachers in the Vision Seed Academy because the student did extremely well in the BEC exams. And I found that I'm a very good teacher. Okay. <laughs> so the intention was to go into education. But through what means, I still have my health um, professions, aspirations. So I knew that if I go into medicine, it will take me a long time to even have my first degree. Okay. So it will be difficult. And how do I fund medicine? So I was torn between medical laboratory sciences and uh, nursing. Those were the last choices I had. So I traveled to Keta to see my uncle, who was the head of science department then, to help me to make the choice. When I got there, he told me, just choose one. Now, I was really not happy. I left back to Accra. Because that was the reason why I traveled all down to Keta to seek for counsel. But it was also good in that I made a decision that turned out to be the best. Um, for me now, I can look back and say I made the best decision. So I finally decided on nursing just by praying and also looking into what is possible. So that's how come I came into nursing. And UCC happened to provide me quite a lot of platform because we were the third batch that were admitted. So it was green still at that time. So there were many things that we could do. For example, pushing for the student association that uh, I became the first vice president who was then elected president. Then we moved on to the national stage to have ANSAG, a university, yeah, which where we met. So sure. those were the, the the platforms that provided a lot of interaction and also leadership training that helped me in growing my career. Mm. But there was a biggest thing that happened to my career that is meeting my mentor whilst doing my daily activities at UCC, which we will talk about, as yeah. you um, mentioned. Very, very, very interesting. I think what I would like to find out, because like I said, I mean, when I met you at the University Nursing Student Association of Ghana, on SAG, as we call it, it was all nice and all that. People thought everyone was doing well. Looking at the background you just given, how did you survive financially on campus? Because like you said, you thought to pay for your admission fees and all that. How did you survive on campus? And how hard was life for you? How did how were you able to balance your challenges, including financial challenges uh, with academics and still be able to excel? How, how did you manage that? Let me tell you this. So sometimes I will run away from school for a week to go and do people teaching in Accra. <laughs> Hey. I'll sleep in a little while. But I think that the, the, the most important thing was the cost control component of the education. So there are places you can stay on campus that are very cheap, but yeah. you, 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 you will not be very proud of it um, in terms of accommodation wise. So we didn't stay in those laborious um, hostels and then we shared rooms we were not having a, a single room to ourselves and also in terms of the things that you could do that bring quite a lot of expenditure you try to avoid it looking at your financial situations then help came from a few uncles like uncle fred idam uncle Geoffrey, and uh, some of my aunties 
here and there. And then we also have a very good support system in terms of colleagues in school. And okay. so it, it was just a balance of everything that uh, make it happen. But as you know, there are many things that you have to use finances for like um, handouts, photocopy. Yeah. Sometimes you have to travel and things like that. But mm -hmm. little bit of support from here and there and also pushing in a lot of efforts from my side uh, was enough to to take me through. Yeah. No, a big thank you to all these people who contributed to how far you've come. Uh, we really want to say a big thank you to you. And um, more importantly, I think, I mean, you continue to be an inspiration, especially for a profession that is still building a brand in terms of people rising in academia and the field in general. Um, you, are, you are a huge inspiration to all of us. And I mean, at your age, associate professor and still rising, we can only say... Um, um, thank you to God and to everyone who has helped. We, we spoke about student leadership and all that. Briefly, just a minute or two, what were your experiences and how has that contributed to your journey so far um, to where you are now? So with our student leadership um, activities, I think it was one of the key things that um, have built my career so far because if you look at the things that we were engaging with at the time, looking at policies, looking at how we could better the profession, even as young as students who are not even professionals yet, meeting people from different backgrounds and also having to learn from them and also share with them experiences. Um, I've been to Tamale on the same ticket. I've been to Central University when they were even not so much uh, grown as they are now and we've been to as you, you mean uganda the university of ghana all these meetings and the deliberations that we have remember i chaired the uh, judicial committee in starting the the answer and so right. you have to read a lot about laws how do organizations operate and as young as maybe we didn't even know what we were doing yeah. at the time but we were just trying our best engaging with people and yeah. then also our patrons were there supporting us here and there i think that it it made us have some form of responsibility at a very young age and also to be accountable to the people that you lead yeah. um all those form of training have yeah. built me um to some extent that growing up i didn't have to struggle to learn some of the things that we had already learned during the student uh, leadership roles. Mm. Yeah. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much. Viewers, we are speaking to Professor Chris Mao, Dela Chris Mao. He's actually a Ghanaian trained nurse and currently an associate professor at the Center for Health Professions Education, Faculty of Health Sciences at North, um, Northwest University in South Africa. And Chris Ma is amazing. He's inspiring. If you've listened to the story so far, you know that as we, we, we want to euphemize and, and find a better word for, he comes from a humble beginning and he's really worked hard by the grace of God to get to wherever he is. And I want to believe that just as I'm already inspired, you are also inspired. My name is Precious Adadid. You'll be ably produced by James Kovner Opal. You spoke about, I mean, um, patrons for ONSAG and the Student Association. And you also spoke about mentorship. One person I have held in high esteem at, up to this point is Professor Janet Gross. And I have I know from far and near that he's one of your greatest mentors. And um, he was also one of the people I saw in Ghana who actually stood up and always served as a patron for student leadership. Wherever we went, I remember there was a time we went for a meeting at, I think, GRNMA Secretariat in Accra. She was there. Wherever we went, we went, she was there. And I was fascinated that, who is this person who is so much interested in the development of students? And I was, and he continued to support us up to this time. Um, God bless you wherever you are, Professor General Gross. But my point really is that, at what point did you realize that mentorship was critical to a successful life, um, journey, uh, in terms of profession and life in general? And what are some of the successful tips you share with people who also want to foster some excellent 
um, mentor mentee relationship. Um, what are some of the tips and what have been your experience? We can leverage your experience to share some things with us here. So, as you mentioned, Professor Gross is my life coach and uh, mentor. Um, you will see me post quite a lot, and people might think I'm crazy about it, but I can tell you I'm more than crazy about it <laughs> because she made the, the, the most different. You know, there's that point where you at the tipping point, you don't know which direction to tip to, mm. and uh, that person pushes you into the right direction. Mm. Yeah, that has been uh, my experience with Professor Gross. She took interest in me when we were having this student um, association. She was also new at the University of Cape Coast then, and so when we were pushing the University Student Association, um, she was watching from afar. I mean, we, we had no idea um, what was it. So one day I went to, that was in 2008, I was at the um, immigration office to pick my first passport. And then I met this white lady also walking in and said, are you CRISPR? And I said, yes. She said, okay, your colleagues are preparing for a conference in Australia. And wouldn't you want to join? I've seen the work you are doing with um, the Nursing Student Association. And I said, wow, wow. <laughs> someone is watching me from afar. You know, that that really like, it got me thinking about a lot of things that you do as an individual, because you know, their eyes watching you from here and there. Yeah. And then, so I went back to see her in the office and we prepared, we couldn't go to Australia yeah. Um, that year because our funding didn't go through but yeah. then we kept on conversations regarding career and association then she then became our first patron yeah. and we had quite a lot of interactions with her she basically funded most of our early association activities yeah. our travels because we haven't started raising funds through dues and stuff at the early stages so oh, that is right. how much of support she has been to the association oh, then i started up a program a project that i brought her on there were quite a lot of um professors that uh, came on to 21st century health foundation at the time okay. one day we were in a meeting in accra i remember it was sneak guest house which is closer to aqua i changed there then Prof looked at me and said, Christmas, you are not supposed to be here. I was like, Prof, I'm kind of coordinating this meeting, so <laughs> I was supposed to be here. She said, no, you are supposed to be going to school. <laughs> and these were things that never crossed my mind. Mm. So I was like, okay, but you know I have to raise money. She said, money doesn't send you to school. It is admission that sends you to school. So I remember this very was close. after after the BSc undergrad, is that right? Yes. Okay. After the BSc. Okay. So when she said money doesn't send you to school, it is admission that sends you to school. Wow. I was a bit confused. Now these were statements that she made. So with all the interactions that we had, couldn't she? I can't share so much yeah uh, in this short time but all the interactions that we have had in terms of all these other professors but there are things that at every stage that this woman does or shares that is like wow it opens another dimension of life to me yeah. i'll share a very simple one with you so we went to the voter region on a project trip mm. i was still then doing my research in the final year we were supposed to submit our case studies. You know, in nursing, we do case studies yeah. um, to, to graduate and also for the nursing council. Yeah. Now, this is someone I've traveled with to the voter region to see our project sites and stuff like that. We got back, we were so tired. I couldn't finish my project work and submit on time. When I submitted it, I got minus one because I submitted it a day. <laughs> And that's a prof. We, I mean, we went to this trip together. I was expecting that I mean, you should consider. Like, 
rules are rules. It doesn't separate you from your class. Yeah. You <laughs> you have to fulfill your student roles at the same time doing your personal stuff. Yeah. Now, these issues of integrity and also being firm, no matter how much the relationship you have mm -hmm. with the person. Like, so I've learned quite a lot of things in passing and in observing mm -hmm. than even sitting in class and being mm -hmm. taught. Mm -hmm. That is how much mentors have um, effect on you. So I always say that your mentor is a picture of your future. Wow. So I could wow. see myself in her shadow. In so I knew that I was standing on her shoulders. It was very easy for me to become what I am now because I could see myself through her. And she had supported me every step of the way to where I am now. That wow. is how much uh, she has been of help to me. I mean, Professor Gross, we hold you in a very high esteem. For us who are not even in UCC and all that, we have had collateral benefits. I have benefited from her from far and, I mean, relatively close as well. I mean, I, 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 I speak to her. Recently, she was on another platform. I hosted her to do a presentation and the impact was great. And we want to say a big thank you to you, Professor Gross. Continue making impact. And um, one thing she said after the meeting that I was so fascinated about was that, Precious, just give me an email to everyone who wants to reach out to me. We have to help the next generation. And I was like, wow, this is so great. I mean, I can't say enough because of time, but we want to say a big thank you to you, Prof. Gross. Um, God bless you wherever you are. So, Chris, I mean, with, using the experience, what you've said so far, if you have to mention or state about three or four points, to help foster excellent mental mentee relationship, what will you tell people who are looking forward to also establishing such relationships? So number one, I want to say that you have to know who um, mentors you. Mm. That is number one, because yeah. it doesn't matter who the person is. If the person doesn't have interest in your growth, mm. that person cannot be your mentor. Wow. At the same time, I would say responsibility okay. lies on you, the mentee, mm. to make the approach and also to put in the efforts. Mm -hmm. There are also issues that you have to look at dependency. Mm. Now, you are not expected to be a dependent mm. on the mentor, but you are like co facilitators of your growth so they bring in ideas and also open your eyes to resources and stuff that you wouldn't because remember they have climbed the three that you are now trying to climb so there are experiences they have that you don't have yeah. and sometimes if you don't ask or you don't share the challenges yeah. you will not receive help so you must be open yeah. to share challenges that are on the way and also to seek for counsel. Mm. You must also know exactly where you are going okay. or where you want to go. All right. That is the only time you can have mentorship towards that direction because it is your goals that are going to drive the interactions in the mentor-mentee relationship. Mm. So it's very, very important. The last thing I will say is that as much as the mentors may be independent, um, self-sustaining and also of much more higher in ranking than you. Every little bit of appreciation mm -hmm. also is important because it helps them feel like, okay, this person thinks about me, not only about himself and things like that. So those are the key things. There are quite a lot of reads around a mental mental relationship but from my personal experience those are um, some of the things i can share with colleagues really insightful thank you chris Mo. so i mean viewers please send in your comments if you have any question for chris Mo, just send them to us we will ask him directly this is one of the reasons why we do live interviews for us to be able to also ask questions directly to our guests and also i mean contribute to it as well because you are part of the show 
you are speaking to Professor Chris Mao, um, Dela Chris Mao. He's an associate professor, and he, of course, is, is a nurse who was trained in Ghana, but currently working or lecturing in South Africa. Chris Mao, we've listened to you move from a very humble beginning. Um, you've had about two years of break in your pre-tertiary education. You've managed to make a decision to pursue nursing, and along the way, you've met mentors. Granted, irrespective of the challenges, you've been able to graduate very nicely with good grace and all that. You meet Professor Gross again, who tells you that you don't you need to be in school. You don't need um, money to be in school, but you need admission. How did that conversation and any other related matters translate into postgraduate studies, i.e. master's and PhD? Can you tell us briefly how you were able to achieve both of them? Great. So after that conversation, I, along that time, we were working with quite a lot of professors. One of them is Professor um, Abraham Anna, who was leading the COVID work at the Noguchi Memorial yeah. Institute uh, of Medical Research. Mm -hmm. So I spoke with Prof and she said, okay, you know, uh, let's talk to the head of nursing, who was um, Dr. Mestina Donko at the time. So she's now professor. So we had a discussion, then I put in the application. Now, at that time, I was two and a half years into practice after um, I would have been two and a half years during the admission process. So they said, we needed three years experience. You haven't got three years experience. So there were difficulties with making decisions. Well, these are set rules. So if you can just clarify, if you're talking about two and a half years in practice, is it on the ward or you were teaching in a nursing school and this application you're talking about, is it for the masters or to apply to go and teach? What exactly? Wonderful. Thank you very much. So I did my national service cum, um, rotation at uh, the Keta Hospital and also the Keta Nursing Training College. So I'll do morning shift teaching because when I was in the last year, I went to Keta and uh, I saw that there is a new nursing training college that is there. So I went to campus to look at what they do there. Then I met the vice principal who said, oh, the one who was teaching clinicals to our students have gone to school and they have two months to prepare for the licensure exam. Could you help us? I said, why not? I'm already, I mean, into the teaching stuff. So I went and I prepared them. They had handed presenting a practicals. Wow. So that led them to write to the National Service Secretary that please, we want this guy for National Service. And they made the DCE also wrote to the Regional Coordinating Council and then they posted me to the school. But you know, with the nursing council, you have to do clinicals. Yeah. So the agreement is that I'll do two shifts for a day. I'll do morning shifts in the training college teaching, then I'll do afternoon shift in the hospital. So that is how for the, the one year um, national service, I had to fulfill both roles. So that was one year. Then after that, I was uh, then doing some work with the West End University College. Mm -hmm. Professor Gross was then their dean, uh, starting the nursing school. She said, come and support me with the clinical component. So. I was also doing clinical instruction there on part-time basis. It was at one point then I also went to train as ENT uh, on a private basis. So I was doing ENT services. Now all these practice uh, coming together <laughs> make up two years, but then they wanted three years before you can get admission into the University of Ghana master's program. And they were very rigid on those requirements. So I couldn't get through. So now I went home because at that time, when I go to teach at West End University, which is at Galilea, closer to Kasua, mm -hmm. I would then stay over at Progress's residence. So that night when I got to the residence, there is someone who knows you now. Yeah. So she's like, Christmas, there's something wrong. Talk to me about it. I was like, yes, this is the discussion I had with um, Prof. Um, Abrahams. Mm -hmm. He said the admission is difficult because 
you don't have the three years that is required for admission. So we have to let it go. And, you know, sometimes you will be surprised that I thought she was going to mourn with me and to say, oh, sorry, this is gone, sorry. She said, no, okay. Now, one of your lecturers is in South Africa doing her PhD. Take the computer, let's look at South Africa. That night, I applied to Vet University, where I did my master's. Yes, this is University how... University of Wet Wetasran, is that right? Yes, Vet Wetasran. So okay. the W is V because it's Afrikaans. Okay. <laughs> so the same night that that disappointment came, it was the same night that I applied to Vet University where I took my master's and also PhD following. Wow. So this is how much someone who serves as a mentor mm. can switch situations that you expect to be mourning or crying about into another life-changing moment mm. for you. Mm. you. You get what I mean? So if mm. I tell you that my tipping point mm. is all about her, like she was like that pivot of my career, mm. I know what it means to have mm. someone like that. Wow. So I finished my master's here at uh, Vet University. Before I finished the master's, that was six months to completion, I was given a PhD admission. Okay. I didn't intend to do PhD and master's in the same university, but then I was also looking at the time before results would come out and you use it to apply to another university, you would have lost six to one year, six months to one year. So when I was given, because they know my results internally, yeah. so they gave me admission. So I took it. So by the time I was graduating, I had already started my PhD. So I bought six months of the previous two years that I lost Okay. with the, the the masters through to the phd program i did my masters in nursing education mm. so i continued with nursing education for the phd where i worked on development of um framework for advanced practice nursing for africa okay once i was finishing with the phd my supervisor um dr armstrong here we had quite a lot of discussions about a postdoc. At the same time, I was having discussions with other universities back home. Professor Ziato then became a, a very important uh, personality uh, for me at the University of Ghana. Mm -hmm. Then I was also having discussions with Professor Japon at the University of Allied Health Sciences. The difficulty was that I want to come home and Professor Japon says, why not put in the application? I did, and he actually took me to the registrar's office and said, push the application through, we want this guy here. Mm. But then I had discussions with my mentor and other people looking at all the opportunities available. And uh, the agreement was that I take on a postdoctoral fellowship because it builds my research career. So I could do much more things than taking a full-time job just after PhD. Mm. The postdoc also, there were three options. Either I take one from the University of Cape Town that had to do with University of Oxford is an exchange kind of program, or I go to University of South Africa, mm. or I stay at VET. So it was also difficult in making the decision, but the life-changing moment my supervisor then asked me to write to one of the professors at the School of Public Health that I need a postdoc. I sent the email at 4.28 and 4.32 p.m. She sent me an email and said, Chris Ma, I have a position for you. Just finish um, your thesis and then you can fill in the position. So I never had interviews for postdoc because these are people that already know the kind of work I do um, within the faculty. So it was like interviews had already been conducted. So immediately I was graduating my PhD. I was also starting with the postdoc. So yeah, 
and I end up spending one year, six months in the postdoc there. Wow, what a journey, Chris. <laughs> I, 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 I have enjoyed the interview up to this point and I mean, mind blowing. Looking at someone from a humble background who I'm sure I want to believe at some point you lost hope. What exactly am I going to do? At this point, you have so many on your table, so many things on your table. And it's, it's, it's just encouraging, very inspiring for me. And I want to believe that people watching also have found i've seen some messages which i'll read to you later but just in few seconds again we we have the underlining understanding that you had financial challenges do we get the impression that both masters and phd were fully funded and was it through scholarship how exactly so this is how it happened mm. i had admission in 2013 of december mm. And that was the first night that I had the admission. Okay. At that time, there was no opportunity to look for funding. Okay. So my mentor then was also stuck in the US because those were the days where aviation fluids were frozen. These are events that mark beginning of periods so I could remember. Okay. Was then in the US stuck because aviation fluids were frozen so she couldn't fly to Ghana so we had a discussion from this is what happened now I got admission no time to look for funding mm -hmm. this is what it means she's like okay do you want to go and I said yes she said okay start preparing for visa once I uh, make the necessary arrangements to to get back to Ghana let us discuss issues of finance mm -hmm. so she ended up funding my master's program for me wow yes in the second year <laughs> in the second year though i had marriage scholarship that pays the fees but I remember living in a, a different country comes with quite a lot of expenditure in terms of accommodation feeding books yeah. and stuff so she paid up the differences to support me to go through the master's and the PhD program. That is how much of support I have received. Chris, well, <laughs> you've blown my mind with all the things you've shared. Look, I've always held progress in high esteem. It's not only you, there are many others she supports, which I know from afar. But this kind gesture adds up to that sort of I mean, the, 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 the respect and the esteem we have for her. Prof. Gross, um, if you're watching us, I want to believe you are, or later you watch it. We want to say we love you. Thank you so much for the support you've given to Chris Mao and many others. And we pray for long life, good health, more money, and many other things for you. Thank you, Prof. Gross. Uh, we are grateful. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded, Chris Mao, I must say. <laughs> But yeah, that is that is it. Thank you so much for sharing. Meet Mr. X, an unhappy businessman who has been waiting for days for his goods to be delivered. Unlike Mr. X, business is booming for Mr. K because of his efficient partnership with Hembeck Sisti Hub, also known as HP Sisti Hub. We are an online platform that sells for goods from across the globe. We only pull high quality standard products from anywhere in the world and ship them right to your doorstep. Be it watches, clothes, bags and many others, do get in touch by contacting us on www.henbeckagency.myshopify.com or you can call us on plus 233-546-022-952. Or Hembeck Travels at gmail.com. Hembeck City, truly a world of endless possibilities. Thank you very much for sticking and staying with us here on the Discovery Show. We say yen to learn. It is, I mean, an interview program that basically sits with professionals in the diaspora and beyond who are making significant impacts in the area of healthcare, education 
politics, religion, and what have you. The whole idea of this platform is to listen to people's story, be encouraged, and also identify what opportunities exist I mean, in their field so that you and I can rise together. So that is the whole idea. Please subscribe to our channel, share with someone, and be inspired um, by Chris Mal and many other interviews we've done. If you want to buy any goods, um, contact, I'm going to speak to you about Handbag 60 Hub. If you want to buy footwear, clothes, watches, bags, and books, you want to buy them in bulk from one country and ship them to the other. Perhaps you have bought them themselves, but you need a shipping agency to help you, or you want the agency to source the best of these products from countries and ship them to you wherever you are. The best agency to deal with is Handbag 60 Hub. Handbag is H E N B E C K 60 Hub. You can contact them on plus two three three five four six zero two two nine five two or send them an email at handbagtravels at gmail.com or just send them a Facebook messenger, a message on Facebook Messenger, and they will reach out to you. Um Chris Mal, again we can talk a lot, but we are just behind time. Very quickly, you've given us a fair idea of the pull and push factors for pursuing postgraduates and obviously going into academia. But briefly, in a minute, if you want to tell people who are nurses or they are in other fields, but they want to consider the pathway of academia, what are the challenges and also the facilitators um, for someone who is an early career researcher and academic like you started with? I, I think that as much as you want to be an academic, mm. I mean, your research and also content knowledge in the area you want to be, um, specialize in becomes important. Okay. So one of the greatest challenges is finding where you can get those training mm. and uh, preferably who you want to learn under that becomes supervisors or promoters mm. um, in various um, jurisdictions. Finding those two things becomes very important because okay. I can tell you that my progress in academia can be traced to my supervisor okay. who was always there for me in terms of whatever and she trusted me with even quite a lot of responsibilities in academia so it became easy for me when i was on my own to do things and uh, people think it's magic but it's because i was given quite a lot of responsibility so the one to lead you there and also where you can get the knowledge becomes the most challenging decisions that uh, an early career um, person can, can be faced with. Those mm. decisions are key. Mm. Wow. Associate professor at a very young age. How do you feel, Chris Mo? Especially, I mean, coming from a background, nursing, where we, ha we only have few professors in nursing globally if i say few it's relative but even in ghana specifically we have few associate profs and professors for how do you feel crispo and of course you've just given us some of the contributing factors how has the journey i know it's been just few days and all that but how do you feel generally and um what has been the contributing factors just in few minutes I, I think that I feel very much grateful to people that have stood with me and also along the way, um, especially with people that have worked with me on collaborations of research here and there, because those are the things that have led me to where I am now. Um, most importantly, I think that I, I am very much indebted to Professor Gross and uh, uh, a few people like um, Professor James Asamani, who was one of my pillars in the, the driving seat. And also quite a lot of people like um, David um, Salifu and also um, Obushi Nim Goma. These are people I worked with, Dr. Armstrong, people that collaborated with me and my postdoc mentor, Professor Leticia Rispo. Okay. Like every bit and pieces of the things that we did together were the things that I joined together to put in an application. So mm. I feel so much grateful for the people that have um, contributed their own sources of 
experience, knowledge, and things like that to get me where I am. Not also forgetting Professor Hada Reisman, who was my director at the center here, mm. and uh, giving me the opportunity to explore and also mm. to grow as mm. much as I can. Uh, I think that those were key things. And I feel so much grateful, I, I can tell you. The responsibilities are great. I could feel like, yeah, there is a heavy burden that I've been place on me with the title and also people <laughs> mention that sometimes someone calls it prof and some another person like this looks like an undergraduate you know <laughs> <laughs> so but then uh, more or less i think that um i'm just trying to you know cope with the the challenges that will come uh, yeah. in a, a bit yeah yeah interesting uh, of course i'm in academia like yourself and use me as an example and for those who are watching who are already in academia or they consider to be in academia if you have to share one or two tips with us just straight to the point to help us navigate the journey so that we can get to where you are if you're looking into our faces and telling us what will you tell us i think number one is having targets mm. so beside my table is i can show you now is quite a lot of targets and requirements as to where I want to be, um, like in the next two years, five years, and 15 years, where I want to be um, is there. Then you do a SWOT analysis, and in, in doing that, you want to look at what are the strengths that you can leverage on to reach where you are going. A typical example, uh, specific to me, was that I needed unique papers to reach where you are you need to graduate people so yeah. i support more of my phd students to, to work and my postgraduate students write by publication okay so if i graduate a phd student it means that i've written four papers minimum so so far i've graduated quite a number so you just multiply those numbers by four already gives you quite a, a lot of so you need to look at what resources and also opportunities exist within the a framework that you work and leverage on those um kind of um, um things to grow mm -hmm. yeah which is important you need to be work smarter and not harder <laughs> you know? the ego <laughs> no, I'm encouraged, Chris. Well, that is, I mean, especially for those of us who have known you for the past years, right from school and all that, you were a pay setter for especially your cohorts and people who are even behind you who are also into academia and intend to be there. I think you are doing great. Um, keep doing um, what you're doing, keep going, and we hope that God will grant you, I mean, greater grounds to move faster, higher beyond what we have seen. We did mention that your master's was in nursing education and all that. And again, currently or recently, I've seen your research borders around health professions, education in general, not only nursing. But I want us to have a, a little bit focus on nursing. What do you think is the general outlook of nursing education and to an extent midway free on the African continent? Do you think our educational system is strong enough I'm asking because I'm involved in a, a similar research work like you are doing um, in some a year, the past year. And you realize that if you look at the African continent, it looks like we, we have a more of a biomedical approach to our nursing education and all that compared to, let's say, the UK that is more centered on looking at the nursing approach that looks at six C's of nursing, NMC code, everything is crafted around that. You have delved more into it. What do you think is the outlook of nursing education on the African continent? I think looking at where we are now and comparing to 2005, um, we have grown in numbers and also in quality. So like, for example, in 2005, you'll see that only about 30% of countries have regulatory bodies that regulate the training of nurses on the continent. Currently, we are sitting about 70% of countries that have regulatory bodies others are in the process of developing it the biggest problem we have now is the numbers so there is that um, pool 
into nursing. So many people want to become nurses for various reasons. And also the private sector coming live on the stream to train also increase the numbers. So our countries are finding it difficult to control the quality components of the training. So that is one of the biggest things on the continent now that we are trying to find out how can we um, find ways and means of dealing with the quality, although we need the numbers, because even countries that have difficulties in recruiting, the numbers that are produced are going into bilateral agreements to export uh, these nurses to um, other countries that need them for some form of support to continue training. But we need to look at the quality Okay. In, in the training okay now of course I'll, I'll talk to you about that nursing um exportation of nurses and all that because i know you've done a uh, research in that area you've modeled what is required and all that i'll talk to you about that very briefly but again as you are into um how do we call it the health professions education i just want to pick your thought just because of time i know you are into african interprofessional education network what you call AFRIPEN and it ties in with what you are into now what exactly is this organization about how is it going to contribute it? I mean to improving the interprofessional education in Africa and even inter interprofessional education what exactly is that if you can do that in a minute or two for us wonderful so um AFRIPEN uh, we call it simply is kind of I can say a community of practice Okay. of people into health professions education specializing in interprofessional education so interprofessional education is defined simply as um two or more health science students coming together to learn from with and about each other okay. and the end result is to improve interprofessional collaborative practice Okay. If, for example, you look into Ghana, the issues that have happened at Nigeria Hospital over the last few weeks wouldn't have happened if there is an interprofessional collaborative practice because it's a teamwork. So whatever mistakes we make is team mistake. Mm -hmm. And whatever gains that we have made becomes the gains of the team. So everyone contributes their role. And so if you learn with about and then also from each other, you will know the roles that the nurse need to play, the roles that the medical doctor need to play, and the things that they do. So you respect their boundaries and also respect um, their profession. And so there won't be that professional friction, and this one feels superior to the other because we all have learned about each one's profession and the roles they play and the boundaries. So this is the drive that AFRIPEN is, is making on the continent. Over the last three weeks, um, I've got two papers um, accepted, one published um, this week and another probably next week. It's all about how do we develop in the professional education programs. Uh, and so that's what we are trying to push on the continent to help all institutions to train our people to learn how to collaborate from when they were in school so they are better uh, people then then when they go into practice, they can keep on that uh, collegial relationship that also improves the outcome. Remember, everything is about our patients. And so whatever fights we have, the end result is with the patient outcomes. And so, yeah, basically that's what we do. Thank you, Chris Mao. I think that is a very important point. And here in the UK, we find a nice way to do it. I mean, always we are promoting multidisciplinary teamwork right from the university. And so even sometimes there are conferences to bring all people together, listen to what the other people do, appreciate that, how you can work together. So I think it's a very important thing. And like you said, that can, I mean, prevent most of the problems we have. You spoke about exportation of nurses. I think you had a publication on 28th of September, 2021. It's titled Modeling the Supply and Need for Health Professionals for Primary Healthcare in Ghana, Implications for Health Professions Education and Employment Planning. We did that publication with James Avoka um, and then Geda Marie Ritzma. So these um, were the people that you did publish with. Um, just a day afterwards, myjoyonline.com did a publication on that. And they titled that Ghana has only 67% of its needed 
health workers. So that was, in fact, the main capture theme from your work. And as it is, like you said, Ghana assistance has, per your model, has about 67% of the healthcare for workers that they need. And I'm just going to highlight one or two very important things for when we tie it in with our conversation. So it says that for six healthcare professionals, it is less than 50% of what is required. This trend is likely to persist until 2035 if no action is taken. The country needs at least 221,593 health professionals across 11 categories in primary care. And it just tells you that Ghana does not have excess of healthcare professionals. We rather have less of that. But of course, there were some exceptions. We did mention that the study revealed that the country has 12,786 midwives or 91.3% instead of 14,002. Again, we are not doing badly when it comes to midwives. So again, it looks like Ghana does not have a, health, a lot of healthcare professionals to meet its needed target, including nurses. However, I think during the my join online interview, you in person did indicate that um, given the fiscal space challenges, the government needs to actively pursue opportunities to export nurses and midwives. Trust you me, just last week, the Minister of Health for Ghana actually broke that news that there's some sort of bilateral relationship or negotiations ongoing when it comes to Ghana and UK to export nurses into the UK. The fine details of that is yet to come out. But of course, there were, I mean, sniped of that to say that you, you have that for three years. The three years is because most of the time, NHS contracts are given for three years, subject to renewal. But I just want to pick your thought. Will you say that I mean, it just fits nicely into what you have suggested, what your study has predicted and all that. What do you think about that? Coming from the backdrop that we don't have a lot of healthcare professionals, but we are doing this predominantly or primarily because of the lack of fiscal space. What is your thought on this decision that has been taken by government? I, I think that um, there are codes that government must fulfill to be able to um, have this bilateral agreement. As I speak with you now, we were in Ghana um, last three weeks to have some um, regional dialogue, right, a WHO uh, program to okay. look at how we can charter the, the way forward for um, health workforce on the continent. Mm -hmm. After that meeting, the Ghana Health Service and the Ministry of had another meeting to um, initiate what we call a health labor market analysis. Um, Professor James Asamani is uh, one of the experts in this area, as I also learned quite a lot from him in that area. Now, you have to show from your health labor market analysis that you have surplus before the code allows you to go into bilateral agreement. So that's what Ghana is into now. I have a PhD student who is also um, ahead of them conducting a health labor market analysis in Ghana to also see what we have going forward. But okay. we have nurses in the country. Mm -hmm. We call them the stock of mm -hmm. nurses. Now, out of this stock, there are people who are not in practice. Though they are nurses, they renew their license, but maybe they are doing something somewhere. There are also people who are actively engaged in uh, employment. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at the gap between those who are employed and the stock is huge. Now, those people who are unemployed, where are they? Some of them are into minor jobs. Some of them are into dangerous employments which do not protect their future. And ILO will tell you that we need to protect the health workforce. Now, if we keep training at the rate that we are training and then the rate at which we are employing is not matching up with the training, we will have a lot of surplus. And uh, I met with Dr. Sabre, who is the... Um, the, the head of HR at the Ghana Health will tell you it's a security risk because people will be agitating all the time. Because every year we are graduating and the private sector is also doing quite a lot. If we want to maintain quality in the training, because we need to provide resources for training, then we need to now find ways and means of having these people who spend money going to school 
um, receive some form of remuneration for um, their training. And how do we do that? In the UK and other places, their youth are not willing to go into health um, professions at this stage. Uh, maybe and you know about the great resignation yeah. out of yeah. the COVID, a lot of people resign. So we are going to help them with the excess that we have in terms of not being able to employ, not because we have more than we need. Though we need them, we cannot employ them. So should we keep them up until when we can employ them, when they have a life to live? So this is the politics aspect of it. So um, the agreement should be signed in such a way that we should not lose what we already have in practice, but we should also be able to receive something that is able to support more training. The biggest problem I see with the policy coming up is that it's a once-off payment that they are thinking. And I think I want to put a voice in that. It should be something that provides remuneration for the country um, regularly. So if their payee maybe is 37% to the UK government, maybe 10% of that should be repatriated to Ghana monthly, or even if it's calculated on yearly basis, because as much as they are in service, uh, we should gain something from uh, where they are being trained. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And of course, you talk about remuneration. I think what um, we've heard so far is that per nurse, that would be like thousand pounds, which is peanuts, so to speak. Yes. And considering that with ethical recruitment, do you think, of course, like I said, the whole thing is yet to be formalized and all that uh, concretized. But granted, that is thousand pounds per person, one off payment, like you rightly said. Is it a good deal? And do you think that is ethically appropriate and all that? As I said, they, they were trying to look at how much it costs to train uh, a nurse, uh, how much it costs government investing in training a nurse. Maybe that's what they have modeled. But I'm saying that they have to have a look at that because as much as they are in service mm. in the UK, they have to have an agreement that spans over time. So if, for example, um, I'm paying maybe £5,000 monthly and maybe 2000 goes to government in terms of a payee or tax, then maybe 10% of that, that is going to government. Because mm. remember, it's a bilateral agreement between the two governments. So if your government is going to benefit about £2,000 monthly from these people who are working, then maybe £500 of that should be repatriated to Ghana monthly. And then it becomes much more sustainable and raises funds for the health professions education in Ghana. So it shouldn't be like we are selling once off. It doesn't make financial sense for um, the country. Okay. Look at this, Chris Mo. This one is from Farin de la Walla. I hope I got the name right. Indeed, Prof. Chris has his students' best interests at heart. Personally, Prof. Chris has been a great source of guidance and support in my PhD journey. Thank you for everything. So that is a validation of all you've been talking about, the great work you've been giving to people. Thanks, Chris. The next one is from, um, I hope I got it him right, um, Nombulu Lombulelo. Lombulelo. Yeah. Fantastic. He says, inspiring journey, intentional and determination portrayed. I mean, I mean, this is fantastic. So that is about that. And Esther Bean says that my favorite word is wow, but I have been wowed. Wow. <laughs> Chris, your journey has been amazing and thanks for sharing all that. I mean, we can speak for hours and hours and hours, but for me, what I've picked up tonight and I mean, morning, afternoon, it depends on where you're watching us from, is the fact that you started from a very humble beginning. Right from there, you didn't give up. People realized there was something in you that was going to be beneficial to the next generation. Somebody who perhaps may not be so enlightened educationally was able to identify, an electrician was able to say that, look, you have something in you I need. And along the way, you didn't just say that because I'm struggling, I want to cut corners, I want to do things, go the bad way, 
you still maintain that focus. And God being so good, he was able to bring destiny helpers your way who were able to support you, hold your hands to go through this journey. And this is where you are. Today serving as an inspiration to many of us. And that is that is that is mind blowing. But of course, I know that you don't you are not only academically focused, you are also a strong man of God, I tell you. So tell us how has that been just in a minute because of time, so we can bring it to the an end. What has been the role of your faith? Because I'm sure there are times you were down, you perhaps you wanted to give up. And how how has your faith and yeah, your trust in God played a role in your journey so far? I, I think that God in, in his um mighty sense guides us in everything we do. And depending heavily on him is one of the foundations of my life. I remember God telling me in 2012 that he would give me a four-point jump. I didn't know the journey he was taking me through, but I knew that he was going to give me a four-point jump. And I knew every two years from 2012 had been a shift, like complete shift of uh, my life. And uh, I've hold on to him in every challenge and every celebration as we go. And I believe that um, people watching should also take some note that the foundation of everything is in him. And if you give him your all, he's going to make you what he wants to. So you will see my team word is that the lifter of my my head is in Psalm 3. three and uh, it's one of the key uh, things. I don't lift myself. I put in what it takes to put in, but I know that there is someone somewhere that lifts me up, and that is God Almighty. Yeah. The ego. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Chris, wow. it's been a it's been a very fantastic interview. Like I always say on this channel, we are not out of words, but we are out of time a lot we could have said a lot there are many more things i would love to ask you to delve into but just because of time but we are grateful you came i know it's been a a long journey but finally you made it and it's been it's been amazing spot on just tell us what are your final words to us if you have to summarize all that you've said what will you tell us or if there's something on your mind or on your heart that i haven't asked you in a minute or two what are your final words I, I think that um, no matter where we are in, in person and also in career-wise, um, look around and see who is next you can lift up. Mm. And uh, in so doing also, you realize that your growth becomes sustainable because you are supporting people that also might have been going or through the journeys that you have also had and support that you have received. Um, I can tell you that because of um, how much I have been watered, I also do my best to water people um, mm -hmm. that are around. And uh, it then enables to my own benefit as I grow the journey. So giving back to society, mm -hmm. it's a, a must that everyone must do. As much as you are watered, um, also try to water. And it's really important. That will be my last message to my colleagues. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share these experiences. Too amazing. I'm sure we could have um, retitled this whole interview as from being a corn mill operator to an associate professor. That's it's, right. It, it's amazing. It's amazing. That's thank right. you so much, Chris Mal. It, it's a blessing. And um, we just want to say, keep doing what you are doing. From afar, I mean, many of us can see what you are doing. Um, through your publications, helping people, and just sharing your story with us. And on this platform, I keep saying that the whole idea is to listen to people's story and to be inspired. We are not bothered about how long we take to speak to people. So far as the message and the information we are getting is credible, and it can impact even a single person, we are more interested in that. That is what we do here on the Discovery Show. We say yearn to learn. Learn from people's experiences. Learn about the opportunities that exist in their own areas and um, so that we can all rise together. We want to say thank you to everybody who has helped you, especially Professor Gross. Prof Gross, 
God richly bless you. Uh, we hold you in an extreme high esteem, and uh, we don't take all your help for granted. Um, Chris Mo, thank you so much for all you do. And I think Nomule, I hope I got the name right, says again, a true ego. Thank you for the insightful interview. Surely the academia is for silos, but it's sustained through collaboration. Thank you for the wisdom shared. God bless. So thank you also for your message and for everyone who was here. If I couldn't um, recognize you because you couldn't send a message, thank you so much for being here. Please subscribe to our channel here on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. The name is The Discovery Show TDS TV. I have been your host, Precious Adadid Yodu, ably produced by James Kwabena Opong. And we have been speaking to Professor Chris Mao de la Chris Mao. Chris Mao is actually a Ghanaian trained nurse and currently he's an associate professor at the Center for Health Professions Education, um, Faculty of Health Sciences at the Northwest University, South Africa. You can call him the Eagle. Thank you very much, the Eagle, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you very much, bro. Stay blessed, and everyone, thank you for watching. Life is a journey and sometimes can be a lonely road. When friends and loved ones forsake you, all you got to do is to be bold. I knew it years ago that those who undermined me had their minds undermined, but I never mind this to keep on undermining because I'm a real good, I must undergo mining. Talking of mining, it leads to discovery. We mine to discover, we learn to discover, we observe to discover. Friends can uncover you at the same time discover you. But I don't want to discover you, I would rather discover more, so I go on the internet and I listen to words of wisdom and intellect, availability of information, interviews of great men and women all over the diaspora and all nations, creativity at its best, dexterity of research, no need to go through any formal education, I introduce you to the discovery show, let your friends and your family know, the struggles before the blow, their highs and their lows, pay attention to this show, it will make you feel at ease, the discovery show on YouTube got the steez, now Perry, the presenter, please pose for the camera, I wanna hear you say cheese, we are airborne like a flu, I wanna hear you sneeze, it's true, the discovery show is live on air, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, see ya. TDS TV, Yan to Learn, host, Perry Precious, executive producer, James.